Hello everyone and welcome to another video on learning geology. Today's video will be on metamorphic rocks and metamorphism. So this is continuing the video series that I started where I teach you geology. My name is Wyant, by the way, for those of you who are new to this. If you want to see some of my other videos on geology, I recommend checking them out either in the description or up here in the corner. Alright, so metamorphism, what is it? Well, metamorphism is when a rock changes from one form to another. Now, metamorphism is driven by mainly two things, heat and pressure. So for a rock to become another rock, you have to have an existing rock in the first place. So for metamorphism to take place, you have to have an existing rock that can be able to go under, undergo metamorphism for it to change into another form. So metamorphism takes place from a pre-existing rock that changes into another rock. That pre-existing rock is called the protolith. And a protolith can either be sedimentary in origin, so sedimentary rock, igneous in origin, whether it's extrusive or intrusive, and even other metamorphic rocks can further progress down the line in metamorphism and continue to change. I like to think of it or compare it to baking bread. So if you put dough in the oven, it comes out as bread, right? So if I have dough in one hand and bread in the other, are they the same thing? No. One's dough, one's bread. But they are made of the same ingredients because metamorphism took place, or cooking, and it changed it from dough to bread, or sedimentary rock to a metamorphic rock. Now, when it comes to metamorphism and geology, it's not as simple as baking bread. So, what drives metamorphism? Well, as I mentioned earlier, heat and pressure. How do you get that heat and pressure? Well, the, well there's a couple different ways you can get that. There's actually two different types of metamorphism. Again, when it comes to geology, there seems to be a two difference of something and everything. You have two different types of metamorphism. You have regional metamorphism, and then you have contact metamorphism. Regional sounds like it is. It's metamorphism that takes place over a large area Contact metamorphism also sounds just like it is. Contact metamorphism is when you have an igneous rock come in contact with another rock and it basically bakes it, causes it to metamorph around the edges of that rock. So if you have a sedimentary rock and a hot magma is injected into it, it'll bake the outlines of that sedimentary rock and cause it to metamorphose. So if sedimentary rocks form at the surface of the earth, how do they become metamorphosed? Well, to become metamorphosed, they have to be buried, pressure, and then they have to be exposed to heat, bacon. And for that to happen, they got to get buried pretty deeply in the earth. But how does that happen? Well, this is going to depend on the geologic environment it's in. So sedimentary layers keep building on top of each other. So let's say they're in a giant basin. An example of this would be the Gulf of Mexico, where you have tons of sediments accumulating in a basin. There are thousands of sediments within the Gulf of Mexico. In other places in the world, in geologic times, you had sediments accumulating. And over time, you get a sediment laying over an older, if you remember sedimentary rocks, the one on the bottom is the oldest. Now over time, the ones on the bottom get buried more and more and more, and all that weight kind of presses down on the earth, burying it slowly over time. So those layers on the bottom, they're getting lots of pressure, and maybe just a little bit of heat which will cause low-grade metamorphism. There are different grades of metamorphism, lower grades, medium grades, and then higher grades, or just low and high-grade metamorphism. But to get your higher-grade metamorphism, you're going to need a little bit more than just being buried. And this is where tectonics come into play. Usually, mountain-building events where you have collisional forces. So if you have one continental plate and another continental plate colliding, you're going to get mountain-building which smushes all this stuff together. Some of it gets pushed down, some of it gets pushed up, so you get metamorphism happening there. An example of this is the Himalayas. But to get even more extreme metamorphism, even more extreme depth, you have subduction zones. For example, where you have oceanic crust subducting underneath continental crust. An example of this is the west coast of Washington, Oregon. That's where you have subduction. So you have sedimental rocks and even igneous rocks that are getting pulled under into the deeper part of the earth where they're getting exposed to more heat and pressure. That on its own generates its own type of metamorphism when it comes to subduction zones. So that's a little bit on metamorphism of itself. Now let's talk about metamorphic rocks. Now you're going to get different metamorphic rocks depending on the metamorphism environment, the geologic environment where metamorphism took place, and it also depend on the composition or the type of protolith rock that it was before it was changed. 
Now there is a large variety of metamorphic rocks. We're not going to get into all of them. We're just going to talk about the basic ones. So when it comes to your metamorphic rocks as a whole, you have two different basic kinds. You have foliated metamorphic rocks and you have non-foliated metamorphic rocks. So the minerals will begin to align themselves and as metamorphism increase, the foliation will become more and more evident. Foliation also typically aligns itself with stress. There's something called differential stress when it comes to tectonics and metamorphism. You can have stress that's re uh, relatively even, where stress from the bottom and top are pretty much the same, as well as the sides. And then sometimes you have more stress coming in from the sides, squeezing the rock. Then you have non-foliated rocks, which don't express foliation. The two most common non-foliated metamorphic rocks are sandstone and limestone. So over time, when a rock is exposed to metamorphism, it'll slowly change. And depending on the strength of the metamorphism, it'll either be low grade or high grade. And over time, that can change. So there's a common chart that is shown when it comes to metamorphism. So let's go over the different grades. So let's go over the common one and the one that is shown in most textbooks and diagrams. So we'll start with shale. Shale is a sedimentary rock. Now when it's exposed to low grade metamorphism, you get slate. Behind me is an example of either slate or shale. Now when it comes to slate and shale, the metamorphism is so low that sometimes you cannot tell the difference without taking the samples into the lab. So you can't really tell the difference between shale and slate sometimes. Behind me, according to the geologic map, they say this is shale. Now, around here, there are other metamorphic rocks, low-grade metamorphic rocks, such as quartzites, which is metamorphosed sandstone. And there are also limestones nearby, but the limestones have been altered to marble. So limestone metamorphoses into marble, and sandstone metamorphose, metamorphoses into quartzite. So behind me is likely slate. Now let's get a close look at this. This slate here, you can see the individual layers still in this rock. The oldest, the one on the bottom being older than the next. A couple of these layers are actually quartzite layers, and some of them are also limestone or uh, calcium carbonate layers. So shale will metamorphose into slate. After that, if metamorphism continues, as it gets, let's say, deeper into the earth or more heat and pressure comes along, that slate will metamorphose into something called thelite. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm good at mispronouncing things. Geologically around here, I couldn't find any outcrops of thelite, so I have none to show you. You can look up some images on the internet if you wish. So if heat and pressure continues even more, thelite will continue to metamorphose into schist. Schist is more of a higher grade metamorphic rock. And then if schist continues to go undergo more heat and pressure, you get the highest grade of metamorphism, which is nice. After nice, you get basically melting, where the nice will start to melt, and you can get a kind of an igneous metamorphic mix called a migmatite, if I pronounce that one right. So depending again on the composition and the rock type, different types of rocks will go under metamorphism differently. For example, if you have a granite underground, it will not go through the other phases that a sedimentary rock would. So in order for granite to metamorphose, it'll have to be under high pressure and high temperature conditions in order for it to metamorphose into a gneiss. So what's really evident usually in gneiss is the foliation and folding of the layers. You can see the, the uh, deformation that has affected this rock. If you look up there, you can see again the individual banding and in layers of the gneiss from the foliation, from the minerals being flattened and aligned within the rock, which gives it gives nice that nice banding effect of different layers. You can see all the folds that are in this rock. Here we have a nice clean example of the foliation and the gneiss. You can see the banding and the different layers in the rock and how they've been folded and foliated. Now, as metamorphism occurs, there are different minerals that are going to start showing up depending on the gradient of metamorphism that you have. Because again, you have low grade, immediate, and high grade metamorphism. So these minerals are called index minerals. Index because they mark specific points when they start to show up in the metamorphism. Now, quartz and feldspars are not index minerals because they show up 
because they can show up in all stages of metamorphism. So quartz and feldspar are not index minerals. Examples of index minerals are chlorite, muscovite, biotite, garnet, and I believe it's pronounced solimanite, to name a few. Now these minerals will start to appear, become visible at different gradients of metamorphism. I believe chlorite starts to show up at the lowest grade of metamorphism. So chlorite will start to pop up in things such as slate. It's a low grade metamorphism. An example of a medium grade metamorphism mineral that will start to appear, I believe, is biotite and garnet. Uh, and the, things, the thing with these index minerals is they can overlap into uh, lower grade, medium grade, or medium grade, higher grade. They can overlap each other, so you have to watch out for that. And these index minerals, once they start to appear, as metamorphism continues, they don't disappear. So once they're formed, they're usually there unless something else happens to them. For example, muscovite is usually shows up between the low, I believe, and the medium grade of metamorphism, but muscovite can also be in high grade metamorphic rocks, be visible in high grade metamorphic rocks. So then, in that case, you have to look for other things such as garnet. So in these rocks, we have lots of biotite, muscovite, and there are garnets here. And in a couple areas around these mountains, you can find solimanite. So where the solimanite is located, you, that is high-grade metamorphic rock. But if you're able to identify the rock itself, the rock around here being nice, you should automatically know that nice is a high-grade metamorphic rock. So you will find the higher-grade index minerals in it. For example, we have this rock here, and you can see there's a little red garnet right there. So again, this nice behind me is an example of a high-grade metamorphic rock, and then an example of a low-grade metamorphic rock would be slate, quartzite, and marble. Now the thing with quartzite and marble, since they do not foliate, that means that they can be exposed to high-grade metamorphism without really changing much. Around here in these mountains, there are outcrops of gneiss with thick layers or bands of quartzite. Because again, quartzite doesn't foliate, and that's all it progresses to. So sandstone, again, is the protolith, the sedimentary version, before it gets metamorphosed into quartzite. And once it is quartzite, that is as far as it progresses, and it will always stay quartzite, unless something else happens to it. So you can get bands of quartzite, and marble even, within schist and gneiss because marble and quartzite do not progress any further, unlike uh, slate becoming phyllite, phyllite becoming schist, and schist becoming nice. All right, and to finish off this video, I thought it'd be a good idea to uh, show some final examples of metamorphic rocks here on my desk. We just recently got some snowfall, so all the rocks outside are now covered. And since I've been just uh, talking away most of this video and not really showing too many rock examples, uh, which is kind of hard to do because metamorphic rocks, you have to do a lot of explaining. <laughs> but uh, here's an example of uh, a schist. You can see that there's garnets in here. Now the thing with uh, schist mostly is it is usually covered in lots of uh, muscovite minerals, which you can see is this reflective uh, mineral here. So schist usually has lots of muscovite. If we break it open, you can see all the uh, reflective mineral, that is all muscovite. If I turn it around on this side, you can see a lot more of that, especially if I break this chunk off. You can see all the muscovite in here, so this is a big chunk of schist with garnets. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that both sedimentary and igneous rocks can metamorphose, even extrusive, meaning lava rocks, as well as intrusive. But uh, here's an example of serpentinite. You can see all these green minerals in here. So serpentinite, I believe, is formed from ultramafic rocks, mainly um, ultramafic intrusions, I believe. Lava, ultramafic lavas are no longer uh, that common to find anymore on the Earth. But, uh, so usually when you do find ultramafic rock, it's in this form here of a serpentinite. They also call these um, mafic igneous rocks greenstones, so there's a thing that they call uh, greenstone belts. These are zones of igneous, usually basaltic, to ultramafic rocks that have been metamorphosed. And when they are metamorphosed, their minerals, uh, mafic minerals, tend to turn green. That's why they call them greenstones and greenstone belts. And you can see this uh, serpentinite has lots of green mineral in it. 
There's a shadow effect from the camera, but you can see all the green. Uh, this black mineral happens to be uh, magnetite. Uh, magnet will stick to this stuff here. So this is uh, a result of ultramafic rock being metamorphosed to produce serpentinite. And when other basaltic rocks are metamorphosed, you'll get other forms of greenstone. And then finally have some more examples of gneiss here, these little chunks here. Now this gneiss is more darker in color because it has more mafic mineral. They do have a name for this type of gneiss. It's called uh, amphibolite. If you look here, you can see there's some big garnets sticking out of this rock. Run right there, a couple here. And here's another example where we have garnet here and garnet here and the amphibolite. All right, so this will conclude the video on metamorphic rocks. I hope, uh, for those of you who stayed and watched the whole thing, I hope you found it helpful and informative, and I hope I didn't mess anything up. <laughs> but uh, I've now covered, I believe, the basic three rock types and a little bit more details on sedimentary and igneous intrusive and extrusive, and I've now finished it up with metamorphic rocks. So, in the future, I hope to get more in-depth with some other topics besides rocks, so we can all connect it and piece it together to make more sense of geology and the planet as a whole. Learning these things can be, well, informative on its own, but it can also be really useful as far as uh, prospecting and looking for these minerals, because if you know how they form and you know where to look for them, you're more likely to find them. So, once again, hope you found this video informative, and I hope you can all join in on the next video. You all take care, and have a great day.